Okay, so welcome to my Inferno guide. Um, this is long awaited. I, um, I've always planned on making one of these even before it came out. So seeing how well my fire cape guides have done in the past, I thought it's time to make an Inferno guide. Um, the one thing I learned when doing my fire cake guides is that I have got like five guides now, I think, or something like that. But what I'm going to say this time at the start of this video, um, check the description now. I plan to upload this on the 21st of September 2017. So if you're watching it quite a while after that, I may have an updated Inferno guide. I don't know yet. So eventually I will actually also be uploading um, the full walkthrough of it, um, which when it's done will be in the description. Um, but pretty much as I'm uploading this video, I'm going on holiday for a week. So obviously it won't be out for a week, but maybe check back in about a week, a week and a half, maybe even two weeks. And hopefully it will be there. Um, but obviously if you're watching this at like on a later date, then it should be there anyway. So apart from that, enjoy the video. Okay, I'm going to put this index screen here. If anyone would like to um, maybe come back to the video like multiple times and only watch a certain section of the video, um, I will be putting links throughout this index page if you want to click straight to that. But this is the structure that I'm going to be using throughout this guide. I'll suggest watching it all first and then if you want to watch certain sections of it um, again afterwards then feel free to do so. So I'm only going to go through two setups uh, for this video. One if you are a rich boy and you have everything in the game and one if you have a little bit of limited supplies. Obviously you're going to have to use your own initiative um, to work out things in between. If you maybe can't afford one thing but you can um, you can over afford the lower uh, setup um, then just use the best in slot for that item that I use. Um, a few things to bring up. In these screenshots I didn't use the imbued heart um, but when doing the actual cape myself I did. Uh, reason being, so if you're 99 mage and you're currently imbued hearted up um, and then you panic brew um, for whatever reason it might be you can actually still barrage after you've brewed uh, which is why I like to bring the heart but I'd only recommend using the heart if maybe you, I don't know, you've got to the boss a few times um, you know you don't use all your brews uh, for a first time person I would definitely recommend not using the heart though for the SGS uh, this is pretty much a must if a lot of your budget is going to your gear I would recommend the SGS being the main part of it a lot of the ways you can just sit behind the pillar uh, SGS the monsters, the monsters and get HP and prayer back. Uh, the range pots, the reason being why I have two is when I was doing this in my early attempts, not in the late attempts, but when I was doing this in the early attempts, um, I always used more than one range pot because I would always take um, certain damage, especially if I'm potting on the jads as well. Uh, I would always use more than one. I think out of all, well, all of my all of my attempts, I only used all of my brews on one attempt, so it was worth bringing the extra range pot just for the extra DPS. Um, a bit of a luxury item, the Twisted Bow. Um, I would definitely recommend it if you can either get a lend or if you can afford it yourself. It's by far the best bow um, because it has the obviously the long uh, range attack. Um, and also it is very good on monsters that are based off mage, so Zuck and the uh, and the mages. Another thing is the Fally Shield. If you've done the Fador Hard or Elite Diaries, um, they can give you prayer regions. Uh, so I think on the Elite one you get like twice per day full prayer points. Uh, the mediums once per day, uh, sorry, the hards once per day, and the mediums like half of it or something. I'm not quite sure. Um, I didn't use these throughout mine because I didn't do any of the diaries. But if you do, I'd recommend bringing uh, the Fally Shield over a Super Restore. In your room pouch, you're going to have to bring Blood Barrage. Um, in my setups, I have a Kodai Wand. But in the lower setup, you will have to uh, get rid of one Brute and bring some Water Runes. Um, if you're not using Kodai ones. Also going back to the lower setup that I've used, um, if you're using a rune crossbow or an armadillo crossbow, you have to bring two types of bolts. Uh, reason being is the ruby bolts have the special attack where it can reduce um, the HP of a monster by 20%. Um, so obviously when it has higher HP, uh, the 20% will be higher. And then as soon as it gets to half HP, you need to switch to your diamond bolts. This is only really used for Zuck as you blow pipe pretty much the rest of the waves. So moving on to the monsters that you'll see throughout the waves, as you'll see at the top um, is the name of that said monster, what I will refer to it as throughout the guide, and also the level that it is. So three nibblers spawn at the start of each wave, except for waves 3, 8, 17 and 34. Uh, you can remember these as it's one wave before a new monster spawn, so on wave 3 they spawn just before the blobs, on wave 8 they spawn just before the melia, Wave 17 before the range, and wave 34 before the mages. Um, so as I say, three of these spawn at the start of each wave. You, the main idea is to clump as many of these as you can with your blood barrage. If you hit a 152 XP barrage drop, 
um, they are all dead, anything less than that and one of them, or at least one of them, will survive. Uh, what they do is they destroy your pillars. If they do destroy your pillars, they then come and attack you and deal uh, like ones and twos. I wouldn't worry about it though. As I said earlier, the whole idea of these is to clump them at the start of the way. However, if it's not safe to browse them a second time um, and you are likely to die, just leave them and sacrifice some of the HP of your pillar uh, and deal with them when it is safe to do so. So the birds or the bats, they're level 85. Um, what they do is they actually drain three run per hit and they also drain a little bit of stats. Um, I wouldn't worry about it. I don't know exactly how much it drains, but it's nothing to worry about. It's um, yeah, very minimal. Max hit of these monsters is 19. Uh, they attack with range and they have an attack speed of three tick. So the blobs, they're a bit of a weird mechanic, what really. What happens is they read whatever you're praying on the third tick and they attack on the sixth tick. So for example, if you're praying range, um, it reads the range prayer and then just before it attacks you need to switch to your mage prayer. Um, once you kill these upon death they split into three different uh, minions, all level 70s, and each minion attacks with a different combat style, so range, mage and melee. Uh, the max hit of these blobs are 29, um, they attack with as I say range and mage and their attack speed is 6 ticks. The meliers are level 240, uh, if they are safe spotted it digs every 20 to 30 seconds um, and they appear straight next to you after a dig. Um, there's no real exact time, it's, I timed like multiple uh, digs and they were all between 20 and 30 seconds. The max hit of these is 49, uh, they attack with melee and they attack every 4 ticks. The rangers level 370, the max hit is 46, they attack with range um, and they attack every 4 ticks. I would, there's no real sort of special ability to these, they can just do some serious damage if you're not praying against them. Also a good thing to note is I would always SGS either the rangers or the blobs um, as it tends to hit quite well. Also they are weak to mage, uh, the blood barrage in them actually works really quite well too. The mages level 490, the special attack is that it revives a monster that has already been killed during that wave. Uh, the special attack you'll be able to see really easily, um, it's sort of a, a glowing effect around the body of it and it raises its two legs. The monster that it just revived um, is spawned in the middle of the cave. Um, and also that said monster does have half HP when it is revived. The max hit of the mages is 70, it attacks with mage um, and it attacks it every 4 ticks. The next monster is the Jad, obviously level 900. Um, on wave 67, um, when it gets to half HP it spawns 5 healers and on 68 and 69 it spawns 3 healers. The max hit of Jads in the Inferno is 113, it attacks with range, mage and melee. Um, and the attack speed is 9 ticks. If you need more help with Jads, you can refer to my Jad Done Easy guide by clicking on the screen uh, where it says here in the bottom right. And the final monster is Zuck at level 1400. I'll go through more information a little bit later, but it is important, well very very important, that you stay behind the shield at all times. Uh, definitely prioritise staying behind the shield overtaking slash dealing damage. So during Zuck, after 45 seconds or one shield rotation, the Major and Ranger will spawn. Uh, Jazz spawns when Zuck hits 480 hit points. The Major and Ranger spawns after roughly 5.5 minutes after the first set of Major and Ranger. Uh, this isn't 100% confirmed by JMods, um, but during my attempts this is roughly what I seem to work out as. There may be more information that comes out um, a little bit later on. Uh, but this is as far as I could work out. The healer spawn when Zuck hits 240 hit points and the third Major and Ranger spawns roughly three and a half minutes after the second set. The max hit for Zuck is 251, obviously a very very high max hit um, and if you do take a hit from Zuck you are more than likely to die. It attacks with Major and Range, however you cannot pray against this. The attack speed for Zuck is 10 ticks or 6 seconds, however towards the end of the fight it actually does go down to 6 ticks. Uh, which is three, almost just over three and a half seconds. So when first doing the Inferno myself, I actually made this um, Excel sheet just so I can understand when everything's actually spawning, but it is really easy to understand. If you know anything about how the fight cave spawns work, um, then it pretty much replicates that. However, it uh, chucks in a whole wave of um, six nibblers uh, just before each new monster starts. If you want more information on this, um, I will make a Google Documents Excel sheet uh, just so you can have a look on when everything spawns. So next thing to move on to is to safe spot some of the monsters um, so you can deal with them more effectively. So on either pillar, the north and the south one, I wouldn't use the west one because it can unlure monsters. I would only really use the north side of the west pillar uh, just because it's in line with the north pillar um, and you can trap anything to the east. 
um, but safe spotting around that um, doesn't work along the north side of that so it's pretty much useless unless you can get a diagonal safe spot on them which I'll show you a little bit later. On the north pillar you can safe spot on the uh, west and the south side um, and on the south pillar you can safe spot uh, again on the west and the south side. This next method does actually work for every single monster in the inferno. Um, it's called diagonal safe spotting. It's been known for ages uh, and it does work actually really quite well in the inferno. Um, if you do get quite a rotten spawn you can stand in the either corner um, and one of the monsters should be safe spotted. So essentially as soon as you see it coming you stand on the tile all the way to the east or all the way to the west which is right next to the pillar uh, depending on which side you actually want to safe spot the monster on. Um, which is obviously dependent on which way it's coming from. Just be careful if you do this to a Melia um, that it will dig after 20 to 30 seconds. However, if you if you are safe spotting a Melia, you can actually move one step north or even, well, three steps north um, and you're still able to attack um, the Melia without it attacking you. So the last thing I want to talk about before actually getting into the methods itself is prayer flicking. Um, people actually have done the Inferno without prayer flicking, but it is highly recommended um, that you learn how to do this as you can conserve uh, a lot of uh, super restores and it allows you to bring more brews and therefore obviously survive longer. So just have a look at this. If you don't know how to do it, then this is a good time to learn. It's really not too hard. Um, it took, you know, it takes a, a good few hours to get used to. Um, but you know, in the inferno, um, you will more than likely need it. So the first type of prayer flicking is lazy flicking. Um, this is only when you just flick on your prayer um, on the exact same tick as when the monster attacks. So for example, um, in the cave, uh, the major and the ranger, which is probably the only ones you're really going to be flicking. Uh, the only ones you're going to be lazy flicking even, um, attack every four ticks. So it's quite easy to get used to um, as they're both the same and you can get into quite a decent rhythm. Um, especially if you are using a blowpipe because blowpipe attacks every two ticks um, and both of them uh, monsters attack with four. So for every two hits of the blowpipe um, you'll be prayer flicking once. Um, obviously when you start to use Twisted Bow or Barrage it can get a little bit more confusing. So the next type of prayer flicking is when you double click your prayer um, every game ticks. Personally I only use this type of prayer flicking um, either at the start of the wave because um, you can actually waste like 3 or 4 prayer points per wave uh, which by in the long run can actually add up to quite a lot so doing it here at this time you can conserve quite a bit or on the early waves uh, on the bats, uh, the blobs and uh, the blob minions or if you're prey flicking multiple monsters of the same combat for example the bats and the rangers so this is 100 beats per minute um, I'll put a metronome in the background now so you can get an idea as to how long this actually is maybe just practice it um, on your mouse you know you don't have to actually be in the inferno to practice it you can just practice it whenever you want um, and if you do it too slow or too fast your prey can turn off so it's quite a risky strategy, so definitely uh, get used to it before uh, you start using it uh, against monsters such as the Major. Okay, so going through the basics for every single wave, at the start of each wave you want to be on the north pillar. Uh, on the west tile, just so you can barrage the nibblers. As soon as you barrage the nibblers once, you need to click back to where you originally started. Uh, this would mean anything to the south of you is safe spotted. Um, and then you need to reassess the situation and see where is the safest place to run to. As I mentioned earlier, if you get 152 um, XP drop on the barrage, that means all nibblers are dead. One thing to get used to towards uh, the later waves, um, I would suggest leaving the nibblers. Well, but barrage them once at the start, so they're frozen for 20 seconds. If the wave setup is too dangerous, just leave them and kill the nibblers when it's safe to do so. As a basic rule of thumb, you want to be praying range um, at the start of wave 18 to 33, and you want to be praying mage um, at the start of wave 35 to 66. Obviously, it depends on where everything spawns and what is attacking you, um, but that's just a basic rule of thumb. For wave 50 plus is when the mages and the rangers start spawning. So you want to be praying mage, obviously, at the start of the wave, uh, and then if the major is safe spotted, you need to switch to your range prayer. For every single wave, you need to aim to kill whatever is attacking you at first, so whatever basically is not safe spotted. And also, if the Melia is on the wave set up, you need to also consider uh, where, what you're going to do, where you're going to run to, when the Melia digs and is going to stand right next to you. If you're able to kill whatever's on you fast enough, obviously when the Melia spawns, you can just kill the Melia on its own. 
However, if something like the Major is attacking you, obviously you don't want to have the Major and the Melia on you at one time, so you may have to consider running somewhere else um, where it is more safe to do so. For every single wave, you want to aim to stand where at least one monster is safe spotted. Don't make this monster the Melia, because um, when it digs, obviously it will stand next to you. Um, it just makes it a lot easier just to have, I don't know, the mage or the range or, or even the blobs at the earlier waves uh, actually stay spotted. As I mentioned earlier, you should also consider um, if it is safe to move somewhere else. If you work out that somewhere else is safer to, to move to, then do so as soon as possible um, and try and do it without taking too much damage. So a few little scenarios here. So if the spawn is uh, just east of the pillar, you can actually run to the north side of the west pillar. This would mean that will get stuck. And also it would allow anything to the southwest uh, to be trapped just to the south of you. So there is actually two spawns um, on the west. So it is the west spawn and the northwest spawn. If a spawn is to the west, uh, that means it will be slightly more south than the northwest spawn. You, you will be able to see it. Um, you can actually run to the most eastern square of the northern side of the pillar. This would mean it will be able to lure closer to you um, and then you would run to the most western square um, still on the northern side of the pillar and you can actually hit this with a barrage or a twisted bow um, without undoing anything to the south. However if you do get a northwest spawn have a look and see if you take more damage standing to the east of that pillar. If you will be taking more damage to the east of that pillar, so for example if two things are south then you need to just run to the east of the pillar, tank one or two hits, um, and then run back to the north of the pillar. And that monster that is to the west will now be closer to you and you can kill it without taking any damage. Another big thing that I see people struggle with a lot is when to actually use range and when to use mage. You should always ask yourself the question, is it worth losing the defense just to be able to heal? So the effect that Blood Barrage has is it's able to uh, recover 25% um, of the damage inflicted. So for example, say you get a max barrage of a 30, uh, that would only actually heal a 7. So if there's something attacking you and it's doing damage with multiple different attack styles um, and you're not able to prayer flick it if you don't feel comfortable for example, then you need to switch to your range and then just blow pipe things down with rigor or, or um, eagle eye uh, and your defense prize activated. However if you are only attacking say one monster or multiple monsters with the same combat style, uh, then you are able to pray a flick and this is when you should be barraging to get your HP back up. If it is a really bad spawn setup, as a last resort you can run to the south pillar. Just make sure you keep your camera facing the highest monster um, and try and flick this when you can. If you don't feel comfortable doing this, just make sure you put on your tank armor um, and keep your HP nice and high. Obviously once you get to the south pillar, you then should consider where to position yourself and definitely consider doing the diagonal technique that I showed earlier if things don't all fall into place just to the north of you. Just always make sure that if you do run to the southern pillar uh, that you try and get back to the northern pillar um, before actually finishing the wave. So when you're able to take uh, no damage, this is when you should run back to the northern pillar and then finish off whatever that one monster is that is attacking you. Always make sure that you're full HP at the end of each wave. It is very helpful for the next wave. Something that sounds really simple but I know people don't do is always make sure that you're full HP at the end of each wave. This may include Sarodam and Godsoul specking uh, whenever you have the specs. I would always suggest specking on the uh, blobs or the rangers as they're the best to hit on. You can also AFK for long periods of time and SGS back in monsters just to get your prior points back. Now, this is the most important tip I can give you throughout literally the whole guide. Uh, if you just take one thing away from this guide, it is always keep your hit points above 20. Realistically, you're not gonna kill the boss for the first time, so use your bruise and learn as much as you can every single attempt. I mean, this guide hopefully will help you, but what will help you much more than this guide is actually doing it yourself and just improving your decision making on every single wave and working out how to take the least damage possible. Probably the most common death in Infernos is people trying to um, just conserve their bruise um, and then they just end up dying to like, I don't know, a little bat just hitting you for a 7. The amount of times I've done that I can't even explain. It's much better just to get as far as you can every single Inferno run. Just get to the highest wave you possibly can. There's no point in dying with 10 bruises left in your invent, that's just a waste of time. So applying the uh, basic methods that I just went through just a minute ago, uh, these are the main methods that you should be using throughout the Inferno. Some may take longer to get used to than others, um, but it is definitely worth getting used to. So the first one is quite simply freezing the Melia if it's coming towards you. Um, naturally you're already in your mage gear um, for when you barrage the Nibblers. If you see the Melia, for example, either west or east, uh, it's just a good idea just to freeze it, just making sure that it doesn't mean you miss any other prayers sort of thing so you'll, you'll still be barraging from north of the pillar um, and just make sure that you're praying the right thing uh, when everything has spawned 
Um, if you do freeze that melee, um, it should give you time to be actually kill that melee as soon as possible without taking too much damage uh, from anything else. Another main thing you need to know is how to move around the pillars safely. So for example, if you are one side of the pillar and you need to be the other one, you need to wait until whatever the attack is on the one that you're currently tanking uh, finishes and then you run and switch your prayer as you then run to the other side of the pillar, like shown on the screen. So, blood flicking. The whole idea of it is that you change your prayer every single game tick. Um, so what would happen is, because the blob reads the prayer on the third game tick and attacks on the sixth game tick, you would always be covered for whatever the blob attacks. And as long as you get the first prayer right from whatever the monster is you're attacking, you can never be hit through your prayer. For example, I'm attacking the ranger in these clips. Uh, just all I've got to do is just make sure that my first prayer is right. So as soon as it attacks me, that's when I pray range. Then switch to mage, switch back to range, back to mage, and then finally back to range for the for the fourth game tick which is when the ranger attacks me again. During that time the blob has read my uh, prayer and of course I'm now praying the right prayer from the actual blob itself. It's really quite a confusing thing to explain uh, but it just it just works okay so it just works just do it honestly it is so good um, as soon it takes like you know not long to get used to. Um, I would suggest on wave 21 when there's a ranger and a blob um, just don't even attack them just tank the prayer hits make sure that you're taking no damage um, and it's really not too hard. I would definitely, definitely, definitely recommend doing it um, as it is a massive help later on in the harder waves. The more sort of common problem solving thing, for example, if you aren't very good at the blob flicking like I showed in the last one, um, a more common example is if they're both safe spotted. This only obviously works if they're both safe spotted. So you can actually barrage uh, the back blob or even twist the boat, whatever you want to do. Just making sure you're praying. Well, in my example, obviously I'll be praying mage because it's a mage. But if you're doing this with the range, obviously make sure you pray range and switch back to mage. Uh, for my example, though, I'm praying mage because oh, there's a mage there. Uh, just keep doing this until the blob's dead. So when you have a range and a major behind the pillar, obviously if they're standing next to each other, you wouldn't need to do anything. Um, you could just kill them one by one by walking out either side of the pillar. But if they're stacked on top of each other, there is two things that you can do. The first method of doing this is that you will be taking a bit of damage. Well, you take you'll be tanking one hit and if you splash you'll be tanking uh, two or even three hits depending on how many times you splash or you can use the way where you take no damage at all so the first method is if you freeze the front monster just obviously make sure that you're praying mage here or you will get hit for like a 70 uh, so you freeze whatever's in front you then need to run back behind the pillar um, all the way along the back line so all the way north of the inferno and run to the northwest corner this will mean that whichever monster is at the back of the two uh, would actually start walking towards you. By that time, obviously, you'd be praying against that monster. And then you'd be able to run back to the north of the pillar, and that would mean that the monsters would then be side by side. However, I wouldn't recommend doing this, um, as you can take quite a lot of damage. And if you splash you know, multiple times, you're looking at taking some serious damage and, and could die. The better way of doing this is if you stand in the middle of the pillar, so there is three squares behind uh, in the front line of the pillar, um, you need to stand on the middle one of those. So if you just attack the back monster, um, that monster that you just attacked, so the back one, will attack one tick before the front one. The reason being is the front monster actually has to move uh, further to be able to attack you. It takes a little bit of timing, but for example, as soon as you see the XP drop, or hear the noise or you know just get an understanding as to when that attack has actually been registered you then need to switch your prayer to the opposite prayer um, and then run back behind the pillar i'll show a few examples of this as it, i know it sounds very complicated but it only takes a few times just to get used to again it was one of those things where i first saw people doing it and i thought oh my god that's so hard that's too risky i'm not going to be able to do that um, but as it took me, yeah, le like literally five minutes to get used to. One little problem that some people have um, is when there is a mage, a range, and then a monster. I mean, this has only really happened when the major respawns one of the monsters. But if you're ever in a situation where you have the major one of the monster and then it can respawn something else, you should always kill the smaller one first if it's behind or in front of it. If it's side to side, just leave it because it can be used to block later on. But if it's behind it or in front of it, definitely kill the smaller monster first before attacking the major. Um, or it can mess up your wave quite severely. So I haven't got any clips of this because I don't do it myself, I try and avoid it. But if you do get to the point where there is, for example, a bat, um, in front of your mage or your uh, range. You need to run all the way north so you're touching the back wall and then run out to the east side and just flinch it. So flinching means that you attack it and then go back behind the pillar and just kill it as fast as possible. So you'd be using your range here, using your eagle eye, make sure you brew up um, if you're ever in trouble. 
and just don't be afraid to use your bruise. It is a really unlucky spawn, it won't happen very often, um, but just try and avoid it by doing what I previously said uh, about killing anything uh, in front or behind the major um, as, as soon as you can before it can before it has the chance to respawn something. Here we are on the hard waves. I don't really want to talk too much about the non-jad waves. I don't like 63, 64, 65, 66. Um, just because it's just doing what you've already been doing, really. Um, 63 does deserve a little bit of a mention, though, because it has like everything on one wave, uh, other, than, uh, other than bats, and it has two blobs in it. Um, so it's quite a hard wave to do. you just got to hope that you have like quite a decent spawn. Um, and just make sure that you kill the Melia um, you know, sort of as soon as possible. If it is safe spotted and you have not a sort of a way out, so you have a place that you can run to and it still be safe spotted, um, then use that and kill it. But uh, essentially you want to kill everything that's attacking you um, as fast as possible. You're not really going to take damage after this, so if you have a lot of brews, I mean, if you're low HP, you should eat and uh, drink a brew anyway. But if you have loads of brews um, at this stage, you're not really going to take damage until Zuck. So, you know, it's quite a good time maybe to, I don't know, brew up, for example, or just don't be afraid to use your brews. So wave 64 is two Melias, a range and a mage. Basically, you want to have the mage safe spotted. If you can safe spot the range as well, then brilliant, but definitely have the mage safe spotted um, so you've only got the ranger and the two Melias on you. Obviously, if you do have the mage and the range safe spotted, um, just pray melee um, and kill the two melees as fast as you can then go on to kill the range so wave 65 is a mage and two rangers um, this one's quite easy the only problem is is you take quite a bit of damage actually getting into the right spot um, you're basically on this wave looking for wherever the mage spawns wherever the mage spawns you need to run to the opposite side so that mage is safe spotted and then as soon as you're as soon as you've got that mage safe spotted you can then change your player to range kill off the two rangers um, and then finish the wave. Wave 66 is really simple, it's just almost preparing yourself for Jad. Uh, this is a double mage wave, um, so obviously you're going to be playing mage throughout the whole wave, um, and then you're going to be killing the two mages. However, if you kill one major first, and then the other major is still alive, there's a, there is a chance that it can respawn that same major again. So what you got to do is you got to do it a little bit like vanguards um, in the raids. So what happens is you get one of them low HP, you then kill the other one, then go back to the one that you've already killed. Um, reason being is so they don't respawn each other. Also remember as soon as you kill the last major uh, on wave 66 all the pillars will be destroyed. If you stand next to them then you can get dealt a large portion of damage so make sure you're standing away from the pillar just before the last major dies. If I were you I'd press log out somewhere on wave 66 just so you can prepare yourself for Jad. As soon as you finish wave 66 you want to stand in this spot which I'm showing on screen. This will be right next to where Jad spawns on wave 67. On wave 67 this is just a single Jad wave. Um, quite easy if you've done Jads before. I mean if not then go and check out my uh, Jad done easy guide first and you can come back here afterwards. Um, but essentially you want to just stand where I am, um, kill the Jad as soon as possible and then lure the healers. Um, as soon as you've aggroed all the healers to you, you want to run straight through Jad. Uh, make sure you pray melee on the way out, uh, just in case you get melee'd. And then you're carrying on killing Jad. If you need any HP, you can blood barrage the healers the other side of Jad. Uh, back so you get to full HP again. Uh, if not, then again just press log out and pray, prepare yourself for triple Jads. So for triple Jads, you want to be standing on the spot that I'm showing on screen now. This is right next to where the southern Jad spawns. Uh, so obviously there are three Jads, and the southern one is the one which I choose to attack first. Uh, the reason why I stand here is actually because it spawns three healers, and only one of them can actually attack you if you stand in this spot. Um, so obviously you won't be taking too much damage from healers. One thing to be careful with here is when you're attacking Jad, obviously when it gets to half HP, the three healers will spawn. Make sure that you're prepared. I would highly suggest taking the aggro of the healers with your Twisted Bow or Armadog Crossbow rather than Barrage. Firstly, for a slightly change in your spellbook so you're not on your prior tab, um, and Jads attack every three ticks when there's three of them. And each Jad attacks every nine ticks, which means there'll be a Jad attack every three ticks. So you haven't got long to react here, um, but essentially you, you just want to bow the three healers uh, there is only three of them, you may need to change your camera angle a little bit, um, it's a little bit of sort of trial and error, but just try and take the aggro of the healers as soon as smoothly as you can. You want to tank the healers and kill Jad, um, and then you want to try and kill the western Jads, again tank the healers and then kill Jad as soon as possible, and then finally kill the eastern Jad and just repeat the same steps as a single Jad. So as soon as it's half HP, the healers spawn, you aggro all the healers, you run through Jad praying melee, and then just barrage 
the remaining healers back up to full HP. Make sure you click to look out uh, somewhere on this wave just before your Zuck. So you're now on Zuck. This just this is the time where just to relax and just take it easy. Um, if you start trying to like do too much in, in such a short space of time or if you panic, this is where mistakes come along. If you can try and relax as much as you can, I was just putting a bit of music on, just chilling out for a bit, um, and that's why I flicked log out on the previous wave. And then as soon as you're ready, this is when it's time to go. So I like it so the shield moves west. If your shield moves east, um, you'll be able to see it. You can just click log out. Just keep relogging until it moves west. The reason being is because when it moves west, you actually get a few extra hits um, on the ranger uh, that spawns on the first major range phase. If it does move east, you have less time to kill the ranger, um, therefore more risk of dying on the first set. Okay, so I'm going to go through some timers now. This isn't 100% confirmed by JMods, um, however I know that some of it is definitely true. So this part is definitely true. 45 seconds into Zuck, the first range and mage set uh, will spawn. It's easily predicted because um, it's one full shield rotation. So if as soon as your shield starts moving west, um, it goes into the corner, it goes all the way east, all the way back west again, and then when it gets back to the west corner, that is 45 seconds gone. That is when the first mage and range will spawn. So this next part isn't 100% true. So when Zuck reaches 600 HP, the timer is paused. This timer determines when the range and mage is spawn. So as soon as it gets to 600 HP, I'm pretty sure that this timer actually stops. As soon as Zuck gets to 480 HP, this is when the Jad will spawn. I'm pretty sure this is when the timer is unpaused. So after the first range and mage set, it's actually more productive to leave the major on the first range and mage set and kill it as soon as Zuck is less than 600 HP. After this, the second range and major will spawn roughly five and a half minutes after the first set. You want to force this spawn. So if you're killing Zuck quite quickly and Zuck is still above 240 hit points, you need to get as close to 240 hit points as possible, but without going below it. I would recommend staying at around 290 because Twisted Bow can hit quite hard. Or if you, obviously if you're using an armor dot crossbow, um, you can judge this, but I wouldn't suggest going much below 300 hit points. So as soon as you do get Zuck to around 300 HP, you need to stop attacking Zuck just here. You then need to just follow the shield and wait for the right time. So as I said earlier, roughly five and a half minutes after the first major range set, the second one will spawn. The reason you wait is you, because you don't want the range of mage spawning at the same time as the healers. This is pretty much an automatic death because you have way too much to concentrate on. So as soon as you killed the mage and ranger, you then need to get Zuck below 240 HP. This is when the healers will spawn. Then after roughly three and a half minutes, the third set of mage and ranger will spawn. This will roughly be when Zuck is almost dead. If you do get to the stage where Zuck only he needs a few more hits, you can just leave this mage and ranger and just kill Zuck. However, if it's going a little bit slower or if you're using like an armadillo crossbow or something, um, you then need to wait and kill the third mage and ranger set and then you can finish off Zuck. So now you know the timings of Zuck, this is how we're going to kill it. Firstly, as soon as you enter the wave, so as soon as you log in pretty much, um, the wall will start moving. You should then follow this wall and make sure you put your vial on the third tile from either end. This is going to be your zone where you know where to attack Zuck. So I like to put my vial on the third tile away from the wall. This means I will be standing on the fourth tile away from each wall. The next thing you need to know is the four spots which you need to attack on. I've already worked out two of them, so you know, on the inside of them two vials. And then the other two will be in the, there's sort of a bunch of rocks sort of halfway in the middle. So you're going to be getting four Zuck hits per shield rotation. This doesn't include the ones in the corner where the shield stays stationary. But where you attack from in the middle um, is where the two sort of bunch of rocks are. Now you know where the four spots are where you need to attack. I was just only attacking in these four spots. If you try and do too much, if you try and attack, then you can be dragged out into Zuck's attack range and you're more than likely to get one hit. A basic rule of thumb is you have to aim to be in line with the front of the shield for whichever direction it's moving. So for example, if it's moving west, you wanna be all the way to the west of the shield as much as you can. You don't wanna be overtaking it and you don't wanna fall behind it. So as I said earlier, after one shield rotation of 45 seconds, the first ranger and major will spawn. So make sure your range pot is with your eagle eye or rigor on. You need to take the aggro of the major, so this means hitting it twice with your twisted bow or armadillo crossbow, until you're roughly in the middle of the room. You will now be next to range. This is when you switch into your blowpipe 
and use a hit and run attack it into the corner. If you feel comfortable prayer flicking it, then do so, um, but if not, then I would just suggest using your blowpipe specs can save you a considerable amount of HP, and obviously it does increase your blowpipe hits. Obviously carry on attacking it when you get into the corner when the shield is stationary, and then follow the shield back out and make sure you kill the ranger. If it is getting to the stage where you're not likely to kill it, you can also twist the bow or armored or crossbow it as the shield is moving away. If you still haven't killed it in that time, you need to wait until you get back there again. Don't risk dealing an extra hit or you're likely to be one hit by Zuck. This is when I was saying that you need to leave the major. So as soon as Zuck gets to less than 600 HP, this is when I think the timer is paused. So you need to kill the major at roughly 550 HP. The reason being, obviously if you kill it when it's higher than 600 HP, you're just wasting time killing the major when you could be killing Zuck. Um, and you're more likely to uh, get a third major range set uh, before actually completing the cave. Jad spawns when Zuck reaches 480 HP. This is when I think the timer is actually paused. You then need to kill Jad in the same way that you were doing before. Just make sure that you attack Jad in the same places where you are with Zuck. No, Jad does seem quite far away, but you can actually attack it uh, if you stand four steps either side. Uh, exactly in the same place where you attack Zuck. So after killing Jad, you then want to get back onto Zuck and do as much damage as you can. However, don't let Zuck go below 240 HP. As soon as Zuck gets to 240 HP, this is when the healers will spawn. You need to prevent this happening until the second set of Mage and Ranger spawn. So you need to get Zuck to as low a HP as possible without going past 240. I was just leaving it around 300 just to be safe. So when the timer reaches six minutes, this is roughly five and a half minutes after the first set, this is when the second ranger and major will spawn. You then need to repeat the same steps you did earlier, just killing the ranger as fast as possible and taking as least damage as possible. Remember to use your blowpipe specs and also make sure you're brewed and range potted up. So after you kill the second set of mage and ranger, um, this is when you can get back on Zuck. As soon as Zuck reaches 240 HP, make sure you're over brewed and range potted up. This is when the healers will spawn. You can also put your redemption prayer on as it can save you for when Zuck is enraged um, and you take damage between like 7 and 11. If you're really close to 240 HP, don't hit Zuck when you're in the middle of the cave. Wait until you're approaching the corner so you can actually attack all four healers in one shield rotation. Leaving this for two shield rotations actually allows Zuck to regain a lot of HP. Um, and you're more likely to see a third set of Mage and Ranger. So when here's spawn, as I say, you put Redemption on and make sure your range potted up. You need to then use your blowpipe, run attack, and make sure you attack all of the healers um, along the wall. The main objective of this is to actually get the aggro of the healers on you. It's not to kill them. Don't risk an extra hit on a healer. Just move on to the next healer and make sure all of them are facing you rather than facing Zuck. This is more than likely to take more than one shield rotation. So just take your time. Don't risk any hits on healers that are too far away. Um, and then just slowly kill all of them. Don't worry about Zuck getting too high HP, it will happen, you can just deal with it afterwards. So after you killed the healers, you then need to kill as much of Zuck as you can until the third set of range and mages spawn. You then need to repeat the previous steps that we've done and just killing the ranger as fast as possible. You can actually leave the mage here and just carry on playing mage and just finish off Zuck until it gets to zero HP. And then congratulations, you now have your infernal cape. I can't even explain how long this video has taken. I mean, I've literally put in Probably the past like five days, I haven't even played RuneScape, I've just been just doing this guide absolutely solid. Um, like all the graphics, all the video work, all the audio, just uh, it's taken <laughs> so, so, so long. And I really hope that you did enjoy it and actually learned something from it. The main thing to take away from this is this guide will not allow you to do it first time. That is it's just impossible. So the biggest tip that I can give you is just use your bruise, keep yourself above 20 HP or even 30 HP if you can, and just last as long as you can on every single Inferno attempt you do. Just use your bruise and just get as far as you can, learning as much as you can every single attempt. As I say, I really hope you did enjoy. I would much appreciate a like on this video. I mean, share it with your friends. Just do as much as you can because it has taken me so so long it is actually the first inferno guide on youtube so feel free to share it on reddit that's absolutely fine with me if you have any questions in the comments then please do ask them if not you can ask me on twitter my twitter dms are always open and also these twitter inboxes go straight directly to my phone so i will be notified as soon as i get one of these so i will be able to reply if you need any extra help i will eventually be making a full walkthrough of the inferno uh, which should be about two and a half hours long. I will upload it to YouTube. It will be in the description of this video somewhere. If it's not there already, I haven't got around to doing it yet. I'm currently on holiday as I'm uploading this video. Um, so it will be up hopefully within the next two weeks. Again, really hope you enjoyed and I will see you next Thursday 
7 p.m. GMT for a new video. Actually, it may more likely be Friday or even Saturday because, um, as I say, I'm coming back from holiday, um, so it might be a while. Yep, anyway, see you soon, and uh, thanks for watching, much appreciated. Uh, give it a like if you liked. Thanks, bye.